Hi, this is Scott Miller. Welcome to my top performance blog. Today, as I often get to do, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Danilo Moggia. And Danilo, tell us a bit about where you work. Well, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Trier in Germany as, as part of the team of uh, Wolfgang Lutz. Perfect. Are you originally from Germany? No, no. I'm, I'm originally from Chile, but uh, yeah, I moved 12 years ago to Barcelona, Spain, and, and there I did uh, my clinical training and, and PhD. And uh, two years and a half ago, I moved to, to Germany. Okay, so now wait. No, I, have to under, I have to understand how this works. Raised in Chile, yeah. moved to Barcelona, speaking to me in English, and living in Germany. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Wow, impressive. Yeah. And at the University of Trier, you're working with a very talented group of people. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an honor and a privilege to be working here for me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, in fact, Gulfgan Lutz uh, have been, he has been working for a while in, in feedback informed treatments and, and, and more recently in treatment personalization research. Right. And Wolfgang Lutz, uh, I, you know, I'm a big fan of his, but also of yours. And the reason I reached out to you was because I, I saw this article that was published in, I think, volume two of the APA handbook on psychotherapy. And the article had a very interesting title, which was, do certain patients respond better to specific forms of psychotherapy? Oh, and yeah, yeah, that's right. And I was really drawn in by the title because this is a question that our field has been asking ever since Gordon Paul raised this question back in the 1960s. And Gordon Paul's question has kind of plagued our field. He asked, we have to figure out the answer to what treatment, by whom, is most effective for this person with that problem under which set of circumstances and how does it come about? And we've been sort of chasing that objective for about, well, more than 50 years now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, And, and I think that is the currently question psychotherapy researchers are, are working uh, to answer. And Danilo, there's a big question, but do you think our field is making progress in answering that question? Currently, I, I, I think uh, there are some progress yeah, in, in answering uh, that question, but uh, that also requires not only new methods, but uh, changing uh, the perspective on, on how we study uh, uh, psychotherapy, specifically psychotherapy outcomes. And, you know, your last statement is what it really struck me as I finished your incredible chapter. And that was, we're talking about a big shift, it seems, in the way at least I was trained and the way most therapists are trained to think about the answer to that question. Now, I'll give you an example. What treatment always makes me think of the treatment model like CBT? And of course, the way I was trained, it was to think about, well, CBT is good for this problem, but not necessarily for this problem. But you're talking about something and your review covers something quite different. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yes, uh, the idea, well, the, the problem with that perspective on uh, for that disorder, uh, this treatment or, or this uh, psychotherapy approach is the recommended, is that these uh, recommendations come from meta-analysis and randomized controlled trials. So, and what happened with randomized controlled trials that uh, the outcome they are talking about is, is a mean, is an average of, of group of patients. So, and usually the heterogeneity of treatment effects remain masked or hidden. Uh, among the average. 
So, and uh, to try to answer Gordon's poll question, what we need to do is to uh, disaggregate these, uh, these effects from the average and look for those group of people who doesn't respond uh, to treatment or respond just a little bit or, or even uh, more than the average. So in, in that regard, it's, it's about identifying heterogeneity and individual differences uh, within this group of uh, treatment response. So hidden in all of these RCTs that have been used by governments and even professional organizations to make lists of recommendations is a lot of individual variability. And Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. What, and, what you usually obtain is, is uh, uh, the normal cure, where most of the people respond probably quite well to the treatment, but uh, at the tail of, of that curve, you have people that respond extremely well, but also people that doesn't respond or respond extremely bad. So the idea is to be able to identify those subgroups or, or subpopulations. And does this mean that the current research that you and others are working on are refining the diagnostic manual and saying that there are multiple subtypes of depression and multiple, or is it something a bit different than that? No, it's, it's, it's different because it's, it's not about uh, working on the, on the disorders necessarily, but trying to identify those uh, personal characteristics that allow to identify the, these, these subpopulations and uh, uh, and specifically um, personal characteristics that are, are very precise or, or specific to, to the individual. Wow. And again, you can't see it because I'm wearing a coat, but each time you speak, <laughs> the hair on my arms and on my neck stands up because it sounds so rich with possibilities. What, what kind of personal characteristics are we talking about here? Yeah, that's a huge point because, because we're talking about tons of personal characteristics since sociodemographic variables like gender, socioeconomic status, age, etc., to more psychological characteristics like uh, personality, um, motivation to change, uh, reactant levels, uh, coping style, uh, etc., to also including uh, like more symptomatic characteristics like severity of, of the symptoms, frequency, intensity, etc. Hmm. And is the idea to create a kind of spreadsheet with certain types of characteristics and certain types of interactional patterns or services that could be delivered and we could follow this is treatment professionals to identify or optimize the service. Is that the idea? Not necessarily, but the, the idea is to, is, is, is to develop models, statistical models uh, based on, on machine learning or artificial intelligence that uh, process these characteristics and give you a, a recommendation. Because uh, I always like to remember about uh, the magical numbers uh, seven. Uh, plus minus two, that of course for a clinician it's, it's impossible to have in mind uh, all, all possible of characteristic or combination of characteristics. Uh, our human mind is, is limited in, in that regard. So the idea is to use technology, specifically these uh, algorithms, to uh, process this information and, and obtain a clinical recommendation for, for a specific patient. Mm. I was thinking about something we wrote about 10 years ago, just looking at, for example, APA's definition of diversity and the elements that comprise diversity. And even if you just have a handful of variables that you have to match the clients on, the number of potential matches grows exponentially. And what you're saying is, is that technology could help us with this since clinicians' ability to figure out exactly what to do at this moment and manage all those variables is pretty limited. How, how would technology help us? Well, uh, here it comes uh, the, the, the example you were giving of, of, the, of the spreadsheets. For, for example, if a new patient is coming to the service, 
we can we can have a comprehensive psychometric assessment with the patient and, and based on the results of, of that assessment the the algorithm can give a clinical recommendation so we can use all those characteristics as the input of the algorithm and and the algorithm can give an output which is a clinical recommendation for example for, for this patient is better to work under this approach or with these treatment strategies but uh, we have to consider that it's just a recommendation. It's, it's not um, something that is aimed to replace human judgment, it's to, it's to complement uh, human judgment. Mm. I know that physicians in medical, the medical world have been using similar algorithms to, for example, keep check of the potential interactions between multiple drugs that a client may be taking. It's so that there's no way, given how many drugs are currently available to the physician, that they could remember all of them or their potential side effects. Technology here would be able to say, consider this, is what you're saying. Consider this, here's perhaps. Okay, yeah. And Danilo, what are we talking about in terms of the improvement over, say, treatment as usual? The average person like me, sitting with my client, based on my clinical experience, if I'm using these algorithms to help me, what might I expect in terms of improved results? Yeah, uh, the idea is as we're in a certain way personalizing the treatment in, in a very specific and precise way to the individual, the idea is to obtain better outcomes that treatment as usual, for example. However, the evidence we have uh, is, is limited. It's, uh, we just have one meta-analysis where personalized treatment based on algorithm uh, uh, have been tested. And, and in fact, uh, is, uh, the results are, are better than, than treatment as usual. But there are no many prospective studies that have tested this kind of, of algorithms. So it's, it's a relatively new technology that uh, have been, it has been developed uh, in our field. So right now, prospective studies where we've, we've been taking canned data sets, analyzing them, looking for these patterns, using machine learning to distill the patterns. Now, what you're saying is more studies need to be done where the algorithms are actively used and we try to track and see what the benefit might be. Yeah, exactly, yes. yes. And Danilo, how does, feedback informed treatment fit into this picture of personalized care because it's slightly different uh, it, you you've delivered a treatment and now you're asking are you connected to it does it make sense and are you making progress is this part of this personalized care yes yes indeed indeed uh, in fact we we can have like three moments uh, in in treatment where we can use these tools one is before starting the treatment, so count, counting a, a, with a pre-treatment recommendation that tell us, for example, what treatment approach to follow with, with a particular patient or what treatment strategy. So, but uh, during treatment, of course, we need to monitor if the treatment is working or not. And, and there is where feedback informed treatment uh, plays its role. So, and, and for example, if we are identifying a patient that is, is not on track, that is deteriorating during treatment, we can also uh, count with this kind of algorithm to tell us how to um, continue the treatment with, with this person that, that is, is not improving or, or deteriorating. And then afterwards, when finishing treatment, also this algorithm can recommend uh, a plan of for follow-up or, or booster sessions uh, of any kind if, if they are necessary, for example. Hmm. Danilo, in terms of reception of these ideas that you're talking about, how are average clinicians responding? Are they excited? Is it a difficult transition, this paradigm shift? What's your experience been? Yeah, in, in, in my experience, I, I think I, I have seen like three groups, like uh, those who are very, very excited with that, that uh, probably are those who love technology and, and love reading about uh, machine learning and, and the new developments on, on, on artificial intelligence, uh, who really would like 
to test this kind of algorithm in their own practice. Then we have those who are a bit um, except uh, 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 reluctant to, to, to them, uh, thinking that probably this is uh, science fiction, that we're not quite there yet. And those who, who are uh, really against uh, this, this technology because uh, they are afraid that they can contaminate the, the human relationship that uh, is part of psychotherapy. Interesting. And I would say perhaps a bit tongue in cheek that our field has often been in the land of science fiction. We believe many things <laughs> that simply the data don't don't support really. I wanted to ask one more question of you. Can you imagine a world in the future where, since you mentioned AI, the client could access these algorithms and begin to hone their choices about who they see, where they are seen, and what strategy? Can you imagine a future like that? Or does a therapist always need to be involved in this? Yeah, well, I think ideally a therapist always should be involved in, in the process of delivering psychotherapy, but which is uh, the delivery, the, the delivery of, of the of the intake can can be part of uh, of a of a different process where technology is involved. For example, I, I'm imagining a client that is accessing uh, through a website or a specific service that offers this this kind of algorithms and filling a series of questions online, and maybe the service then give you a recommendation directly to the client in, in the sense that. Okay, this is the best therapist for you in, in this area because he or she has shown uh, the, the best outcomes with this particular kind of clients that match with your, your profile, for example. Perfect. Another question occurred to me as you were talking. Is it okay if I asked it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. So the studies that we have right now, if I've understood you correctly in the chapter, are really studies done within the context of psychotherapy. Could you imagine applying mach and machine learning to change occurring naturalistically? People who have these problems, but somehow manage to improve nonetheless without access to, some of the same principles may apply, but could people and could we at some point study why are some people more able to change and what do they do even outside the professional circle? Is that a, even a possibility? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a possibility and, and it's a good question. Yeah, usually we, we work with data that comes from our clinics and, uh, because uh, it's, it's where we work, uh, but probably we need to chase those people outside of our clinics and, and, and study what, what happened with them. And, and, and in fact, I think it's, it's possible especially with these new technologies, uh, because it's easy to collect data with uh, mobile phones or, or, or other kind of wearable devices. And uh, yeah, it's, it's something that can, can be performed, I think. Cool. Well, like you say, nowadays we swim in data, but the work that you and your colleagues are doing, what is so exciting to me is that you're trying to make sense of that data and make it so that we clinicians can use it to improve outcomes of the clients that we serve. Thank you so much for talking with me today, Danilo. Thanks to you for inviting me. I found a new person to test out my luck. Is it wrong that I want her?